Hi, I'm Doug Keck, and welcome to the Catholic Sphere. Each week, we tackle topics important to Catholics around the globe with a different host and a different focus. And this week, our subject is theology. The topic, does God's merciful love mean never having to say you're sorry? To help us answer that question, we welcome our distinguished panel of experts. Colin Donovan, Vice President of Theology here at EW10 in Irondale. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, a very familiar face here on EW10, hosting many shows. A prolific author as well, Our Life of Service, the Handbook of Catholic Deacons. And back with us again, Father Chris Alar, host of Living Divine Mercy here on EW10 and the director of the Association of Marian Helpers in Stockbridge. Of course, Massachusetts in the home of Divine Mercy. Welcome, panel. Thank you for joining us on this program having to do with God's mercy and how much can we rely on it. Now, of course, the play on words is from the old love story uh, from the 1970 film, 7172, in a time frame when the idea was supposed to be love means never having to say you're sorry. Now, I think in retrospect, we all know that was probably the stupidest thing that was ever said in print or on film. But it seems like in some ways, Father Chris, that when it comes to divine mercy, people seem to think the same thing with our Lord. Is that true? Yeah, there, uh, we get accused often of uh, merciful Jesus being anything goes. Uh, license, remember though, Doug, is different from freedom. Freedom is the ability to do what you ought to do, not what you want to do, that's license. Um, and so we have to realize that in the relationship of the Trinity, uh, relationships, um, we as uh, a family mirror that relationship of the Trinity. Remember Augustine, um, you know, the, you have the Father, the Lover, the Son, the Beloved, and the love between them is the Holy Spirit. Well, the family's a mirror of that. You have the, the husband, the lover, you have the wife, the beloved, and the love between them is so great that from it comes the child. Now, here's the thing. Those relationships are just that, relations. And in order to maintain relations, we have to maintain a give and a take on the human level. And in God, in the Trinity, it's perfect. There's perfect love. Mm -hmm. But we're striving for that. We're just a mirror, an imperfect mirror of that. But what it means is we, we have to strive to be able to maintain that, that relation that we see in the Trinity. And with it has to come saying we're sorry. And that's really what confession is about. What do we do when we go to God? We say, first of all, here's what I did. And then in our act of contrition, we say, well, now, Lord, I'm sorry for that. And, you know, remember, confession, Doug, is not just about God. It, surprisingly, um, confession is also about God and community. The priest is not just persona Christi of Jesus Christ, but he's also representative of the church. And he represents all those people that I have hurt that uh, if I go to the confessional that I've heard. You know, Doug, I, I equate it to the nail in the wall. Mm -hmm. um, in the confessional, we, it's when we sin, we nail that nail into the wall. And in confession, that nail's pulled out, but there's the hole in the wall, mm -hmm. and that's got to be removed and patched as well. And that's where saying we're sorry comes into play. Right. Well, Deacon Harold, let me, let me ask you, you go out and about, you do a lot of speaking out there. And certainly in the last couple of years, you'd say an emphasis was made post Vatican II and maybe an adjustment appropriately to kind of emphasize God's mercy as opposed to, you know, threatening people that you're all going to go to hell or the path is very narrow. But the God is merciful, obviously divine mercy, as Father Chris Alar has with St. Faustina, the ocean of mercy, that God loves us just the way we are. So what does that mean in our lives? Well, divine mercy is the Father's merciful love, right? It's God's loving response to overcoming evil and suffering in the world. So divine mercy becomes visible in and through the person of Jesus Christ, through his words and actions, his death and his resurrection. So um, when we're experiencing mercy, we're experiencing God's own divine mercy and love. Now, this is very personal um, to me, you know, because of this was basically the story uh, of my father, you know, and, and how basically by watching the network EWTN, he became 
open to receiving God's divine mercy in his own life. You know, he was never interested in faith. He was never interested in religion. He was never really open to receiving anything that God wanted to give him. Uh, and it was what, of all people, of all people, Mother Angelica. Watch, he thought he was going to be watching me, but instead he started watching Mother Angelica, and he didn't turn the channel. I mean, he didn't turn away. And when I asked him later, why did you watch the whole thing? He said, she just made so much sense. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, Doug, uh, Mo Mother Angelica was a vehicle of mercy to my father. Right. You know, and and, and that, and when, when we receive that message, when we, when, when we become vehicles of mercy in the lives of others, then they become open to receiving the mercy that God truly wants to give them. Right. Well, in, in a sense, your father was like the prodigal son. And, and, and Colin, in, in thinking about the prodigal son, we hear that many times, you know, mm -hmm. God's mercy welcoming him back. But there's always the idea that it's, it has to be the idea that the person involved has to make the first move, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, in John Paul II's beautiful encyclical on the Father, which he wrote in preparation for the great Jubilee 2000, he, uh, rich in mercy, it was called, and it was about the story of the prodigal son and explaining how this exemplifies the divine mercy. Deacon Harold mentioned to it about, about how God wants to lift us up. And the Pope described God's mercy as the divine love reaching down into the misery of the individual and lifting them up out of that misery. Now, misery can be all kinds of things. We know the healing miracles of our Lord. We know the, the uh, souls that were released from devils and these things. But it's primarily the moral misery of sin into which we fall. And if God just lifted us up and put us on the path and left us caked with mud, that would be not, wouldn't be sufficient. So the Pope says it's to lift the person up in their human dignity and restore to them the value of their human dignity. And so that's what the divine mercy does. It restores to us the dignity of our, uh, of our humanity. And it can only do that by comparing it with the holiness of God and the dignity of man as he created it. And that's where the moral <laughs> law, the moral norms, the role of conscience comes in and why we need to be taught what it is the standard of God that we must satisfy what represents our our human dignity and that's what god wishes to restore to us and the church has that uh, as its ministry through the sacraments through its pastoral work uh, and so that's why it mm -hmm. it does involve to to say you're sorry means to recognize that i failed to live up to the standard whose standard is it my neighbor's standard is it my wife's standard, or is it God's mm -hmm. standard? And conscience tells us it's God's standard, and we make the measurement against that. And that's how God will lift us up and restore us to the value that he intended for us. Well, let me ask you, Colin, since you're talking about forgiveness and asking uh, you know, somebody, telling them you're sorry, it seems like in a lot of the situations we have in today's world, it's kind of like, well, I, I apologize that I may have hurt you or that you might have felt bad kind of a, a non-apology apologizing. Well, that's certainly true. And I think when you have, as our world does today, uh, a world that is influenced by secularism uh, within the church, the, a world that is a, a church that is influenced by false theories of theology and morality especially. And so the standard then becomes the standard that I have, not a standard, the standard of God or is taught by the church. And so it's very easy in that context to say, well, uh, essentially what they're saying is, by my standard, I didn't offend you. So there's no universal standard that I recognize and that we all recognize that I can compare my behavior and my words against. Therefore, if you're taking offense, then I, I'm sorry you took offense. I'm not sorry I did what I did because I complied with my personal standard. Right, absolutely. Now, also, uh, as you were alluding to earlier, Father Chris, the idea of, you know, sometimes people rely too much on the mercy through the, you know, talking about St. Faustina and divine mercy. And sometimes there's questions. People say, well, the Sacred Heart was about reparation and that, you know, we need to make reparations. Now, that was superseded by divine mercy. It took away the idea of reparation, but that's not true, is it? 
No, actually, uh, divine mercy fulfills Sacred Heart, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Jesus taught sh through St. Margaret Mary Alacoque uh, in 1673 that um, I am love, because Jansenism had set in um, this fear of God. He's an ogre. So God had to reteach the world that I am love. Come to me. So I want you to come to me to know that I am love, because, again, Jansenism was distorting that. Instead, we didn't. We didn't listen. So now God is coming to us. That's why in the left foot, of the image of divine mercy, you see Jesus stepping forward because that love, first God teaches us he is love, but then when you put that love into action, it becomes mercy. And so the problem is until we are recognizing our misery, can God's movement towards us be effective. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, you made a good point earlier. You said, and uh, God loves me just the way I am. Yes, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. No offense, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but God, God loves you too much to let you stay that way. This is very true. So what we have to understand is in the message of divine mercy, God is coming to us and that love turns to action. Now, here's the interesting thing for me. People are fascinated when we say even Satan can be used in God's plan of salvation. And people are like, wait a minute, he's the great enemy. True. But unknowns to him, he can be used in our God's plan of salvation. Here's how. God told St. Faustina, Jesus told St. Faustina that the only way that his mercy is effective is if we recognize our need for it. And the only way you're going to recognize your need for it is to know your misery. So we have to be, in a sense, recognizing that we are broken and we are miserable. And who better to do that than Satan? Now, you have to keep that in perspective because we don't want to listen to Satan. But what you have to recognize is, yes, I am broken. You know, you're broken. You know, Satan's the accuser. You're a sinner. You're broken. You're absolutely right. I don't engage in a conversation, but I am broken. I am a sinner, and that's just why I need God's mercy. And that's why Paul says in the scriptures that that's the reason God allowed us to fall into sin was that he could show us his mercy. I, I think it's incredible. It's an amazing concept. Right. Deacon Harold uh, in James uh, 2 and 13 talks about mercy triumphs over judgment. And before that, it says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So you've got the two there. They go together, right? Yes, that's right. Um, we have to remember what we talk about when we say judgment, right? The Catholic principle is this. We love everyone, but we always don't love their actions. And we judge actions we never judge people, right? Because the only one that could judge people is God himself, right? So, so that's the Catholic principle. We have to judge actions, not people. And so when we, when we look at someone, what, what is our job? Our job is to help show them and reveal to them the power of God's love. We may be asked to be vehicles of mercy in the, in the lives of someone else, just like Mother Angelica was to my dad. Mm. And, and, uh, it's not about judgment. I mean, yes, there was a time that I did not speak to my dad for quite some time because I was angry and I was judging him. Mm -hmm. and, and But when I started to understand that that he was, as, as Father Eli said so beautifully, uh, my father was a broken man. All of us are broken. But but to to realize that in that brokenness, my father was truly seeking that which can only satisfy the deepest longing and desires of our hearts, which is a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and how God used both EWTN and, and, my, and me mm -hmm. to be vehicles of mercy in the life of my father. Because one of the things that I did, um, Doug, was I asked my father to forgive me mm -hmm. for, for not speaking to him for 18 years, for telling my grandchildren, his grandchildren, that he was dead when they asked about him. I mean, that's how much I how much hatred I had in my heart because of what was done by my father. But when, when I, when I as, as Father Eli said, when I took that step forward to be a vehicle of mercy in the life of my father, that opened the floodgates because literally my father did forgive me and that took our relationship to a whole nother level. It was through that that we were able to pray together for the first time. 
And so it's not about judging because, you know, uh, all of us are going to be judged by God. But it's recognizing the fact that God is calling us, even in difficult circumstances, to be a vehicle of mercy to others. Right. Now, Colin, let me ask you, it seems like, you know, if, if one takes the concept of mercy and just uh, amplifies it to a degree, it becomes, well, God is love and he's all merciful, so no one could possibly be going to hell. Everyone must be ultimately saved. Is that the church's position? No, because you won't find that taught in sacred scripture or in the fathers of the church. Uh, so we're bound by what uh, Christ through his church and with the charism of infallibility that he gave to the, to the church to teach uh, faithfully what he taught. We find that that's just not really a, a tenable perspective or point of view. Uh, but And it also, I think, on the very points we've talked about today, each of us in our different ways, uh, makes, the, you know, makes the point that it looks very subjectively at human life uh, as not a living out of a gift of God and all that that gift uh, means in terms of the obedience to God, our Creator, our God, our Redeemer, God, our Sanctifier, and how we ought to live that obedience, uh, but it becomes very, uh, a very egotistical kind of uh, viewpoint. And so I don't think, uh, you know, it may, be, mm -hmm. it may be very comfortable idea that no matter what I do, uh, that I'm going to go to heaven. Now, there is an element of truth in that because until the moment we are dead, we can decide on behalf of God. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that we don't know when that moment is and therefore we ought to decide now. Uh, so there is a, a, a catch-22 to that uh, if you take that perspective and you wait too long. So it's not a right. very good way to live your life. Right, Deacon Harold, uh, an article I, I saw recently uh, talked about the idea, and because you're out on the road, uh, it says the evangelist who foolishly thinks universalism will make it easier to preach the gospel will see that without the bad news, the good news isn't taken seriously. On this view, Christianity becomes a faith that seeks to merely make heaven on earth, and by that point, it's nothing more than secular humanism playing dress up on Sundays. What's your thought? No, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, we have to understand that secular humanism has become a religion in this country. You know, um, that th they worship the trinity of me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's the trinity of the culture. And, and so when, so what is the focus of that love, though? The self. Think, think about this for a second. You get to a point in your life where, the, where you have everything that the culture says you have to have to be happy and free and fulfilled. Right? Freedom, again, uh, as Father Alar said, is, is really license. And you, you get there, and you still don't feel satisfied. You still feel that something is missing. What do we call that? Midlife crisis. Hmm. What is it a crisis of? It's a crisis of faith. But what's the culture's answer to midlife crisis? More stuff, bigger car, better house, um, you know, more material things, more money. Those things will make me happy. And they will never satisfy because it will never satisfy what the heart truly longs for deep intimate personal relationship with jesus christ that's why paul says money's not the root of all evil the love of money is the root of all evil because when anything that takes you away from god um, when that becomes your god <laughs> that be then it becomes your problem and all god is doing with hell is respecting our free will choice to say no to him that's how much God loves us. He loves us enough to respect our decision to say no to him. Now, who would ever want to say no, right? As, as, as uh, uh, Colin Donovan was talking about, I mean, who would ever want to choose to say no? But there are people who do choose to say no. We see that from the revelation of St. Faustina. We see that in the Blessed Mother's revelations to the, to the children at Fatima. Um, you know, so, but, so we have to understand that there are eternal consequences for our actions on this earth. Right. Father Chris, as far as St. Faustina, obviously with the diary and our Lord and our interaction with him, the idea that everybody was going to heaven certainly wasn't the case, right? Yeah, she described in detail the two roads that match what we hear in Scripture. She said, on the one road, I noticed that there many were traveling it. They were merry, dancing, uh, celebrating, and then all of a sudden, they fell off a cliff. 
<laughs> so it was a very abrupt and an eye-opening uh, end to their path. On the other path, she saw very narrow, full of rocks, full of thorns. Mm -hmm. People were falling, tears, crying, but that path ended in a beautiful garden. Now, people say, well, how could a just God allow that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, Doug, earlier we mentioned about justice being mercy. If I may add to what St. Faustina said is God's mercy is his justice because what is justice? Justice is giving someone their due. That's why actually religion, going to church, is under the virtue of justice. We owe God our due worship. Now, what I think is fascinating about God's mercy equaling his justice is this. God's giving, okay, if you look at <clears throat> what is just, God says the sinner has right to his mercy. That is justice. Why? Because the sick deserve the physician. Mm -hmm. We know that in scripture. It is the sick who deserve the doctor, not the well. So if I'm a sinner and I'm broken, by God's very justice, he owes, in his own words, he owes me mercy because I have a right to it. I'm broken. I'm, I'm, I'm like a soldier shot that deserves the medic. Now, the problem is too many people don't turn to receive it. We have to receive it. We have to ask for it. And that's the A of the ABCs of mercy. Right. Ask for God's mercy. Because none of this happens if we don't ask for this forgiveness, this mercy. And that is where, Doug, you begin with saying, right. I'm sorry. Right, absolutely. Colin, uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles of, of late memory said it is good that God has left us without exact information about salvation. He said, if we knew that virtually everybody would be damned, we'd be tempted to despair. If we knew that all or nearly all were saved, we might become presumptuous. Your thoughts? Well, that's a good summary of the moral law. And uh, we've been talking a good deal about the virtues here. We're talking about justice and piety. Uh, Father mentioned with respect to going to Mass and uh, fulfilling our religious obligations. Uh, but we can also talk that the, w the way that we fail against the virtues usually is by one or the other extreme, uh, extreme of excess or extreme of, of uh, deficit. Mm -hmm. And so we can think with respect to mercy, on the one hand, the excess of that is a presumption on God that no matter how much I sin, I am safe. I don't have to say I'm sorry. I don't have to ask forgiveness. And of course, what's naturally, we don't ask God, why do we even have to ask our neighbor, our spouse, our friend, our, our boss, or whomever? Mm -hmm. So we just communicate that into, into social life as well. And at the other end is despair, that there, there is no solution to this problem. I can't be saved. My sins are too great. And so either of those are, are wrong. They're, they don't trust in God. They don't have confidence in this very point that Deacon Harold mentioned. That is that God, due to his own honor of who he is, the fact that he's our creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, he will extend mercy to us if we if we turn to him, right. he has that as an obligation of his own honor, of justice, and so on. Right. In your own personal life, have you experienced that, Colin, that, that forgiveness? You know, absolutely. I remember going into the seminary, it was a good thing recommended to me to make a general confession. I didn't have to do it, but I think a priest, when they are ordained, uh, that's a good practice, or religious, or whomever. And I found that to be a very liberating thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose I didn't have a particularly evil life, but nonetheless, I was a sinner like everybody, and to acknowledge that before God, it was a tremendous release, and a special release because I had looked at the whole of my life and had tried to start off on a new path in a special way. And frankly, that's something each of us can do. We can make a general confession, uh, and I think that's something good, maybe for next Lent. We've missed this Lent th this year, but maybe some Lent to, to do that and to start out <coughs> fresh. Deacon Harold, you talked already uh, quite vividly about your relationship with your father. What about your experience of your own forgiveness that you took from the Lord? Yes. Um, you know, uh, the way I like to describe it, Doug, and this has happened several times in my life, uh, that the part of the, the story of the prodigal son that, that I think people would just need to appreciate, two, two quick things. One, when Jesus says he was in the pig pen. Now, we know from Leviticus uh, chapter 7 and, and 11 with the dietary laws that pigs were 
you know, considered, um, you know, filthy animals mm -hmm. and that they couldn't consume them. But, but Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. He says he longed to eat what the pigs ate, right? So, so it's not just being with the pigs. He longed to eat what they eat, and they eat garbage. You know, so he was showing that this young man was at the lowest point in his life. Like people hearing that would have thought, oh, my goodness, it can't get any worse than this. Yet even in the midst of that, when he was at his lowest, is when he realized that yeah. is the point where I realized only God can help me right now. And that's when he makes the brave decision to turn back toward the Lord. He rehearses in his head, then he makes that courageous step back to God. And the best, for me, the best part of that parable is the father caught sight of him. He was still a long way off. Even though we're th right. we think we're farther away from where we should be, there's the father calling us back, looking for us. He never takes his eyes off us, and he runs to meet the, meets us with his ocean of mercy. Just before we leave, Father Chris, on the way out, if you could just give us an idea of, from the Divine Mercy perspective, asking people to reach out to the Lord at this time. Yes, we <clears throat> we have uh, in this beautiful grace uh, that's given to us, especially on Divine Mercy Sunday, we have an opportunity because remember, we receive mercy from God, we breathe it in, but then we have to exhale it and we have to bring that mercy to each other. So let us all reach out, be able to receive God's mercy, but then exhale it out and give it to the world. That's what living Divine Mercy is all about. And we maintain those relationships by apologizing and helping to maintain common equity within our daily tasks. And it's so important that the foundation of that be God's mercy. Very Absolutely. Important. Amen. Thank you so much, panel. Colin Donovan, Deacon Halberg Sivers, and Father Chris Alar as well. And we thank you all for joining us here on EWTN's The Catholic Spear. And don't forget to join us next week when we'll have another host and another topic.